so I've avoided this story because I've been trying to make sure that I only punch up and limit how often I punch down, especially if it's something that, that has not hurt anybody. But it appears that this thing has gotten to a point where I, my head's gonna explode. So I haven't talked about her, but are you familiar with the woman that got Gorilla Glue in her hair? And also when I say got Gorilla Glue in her hair, I don't mean like it was an accident. Like not in the sense that she slipped and fell head first into a vat of Gorilla Glue, but uh, rather I guess she thought it was a hair product or at least that it could be easily removed from hair. And my initial reaction to hearing that news was, oh, that's kind of funny. That's really sad. I feel bad for her. I hope things work out. It seems really uncomfortable and as angry as I sometimes get by the news cycle, I'm a very empathetic person. But if some of the new reporting is accurate. Uh -uh. Mean Phil coming out. I hate it. Y'all love it. Because according to reports, after these TikToks went viral, you had people reaching out saying, hey, I think maybe do this. Even Gorilla Glue reached out saying, hey, maybe try this. She goes to the ER, apparently spends 22 hours there. No good results. There's now reportedly a plastic surgeon in LA saying, hey, for free, I'll try and fix it. I think I can do it. But according to TMZ, their sources say that this woman, Tessica, has hired an attorney and is weighing her legal options against Gorilla Glue. With them adding, we're told the label on the product she used says do not use on eyes, skin, or clothing with no mention of hair, which Tessica feels is misleading. They go on to say that Gorilla Glue says all its products are considered permanent and the packaging states it as well, but claiming we're told Tessica felt it was okay because the product said multi-use. So with all of that said, I want to preface uh, what is about to come out of my mouth with two key things. One, if you're one of these garbage people, racist trolls that, that have taken this hate as a way to, I've seen a lot of people using gorilla as a racial slur, uh, please just disappear and stop existing. Even though I am about to be critical, we are in no way on the same side, I think you are scum. And two, what I'm about to say is purely based on the reporting that there is a lawsuit being thought about. If it turns out that's misinformation or people were lying, I don't, I don't have the same opinion, disclaimer, disclaimer. But if it is true, absolutely not. I'm all for people getting that bag, but I am not in support of stupid people being rewarded for being stupid. Gorilla Glue spray adhesive is for home and work craft projects that include things like paper, wood, and cardboard. You're trying to get someone else to give you money because you possibly put a product for crafts in the same area where you put beauty and hair products? Something so dangerous that it has a warning label on the bottle to not even get it on your clothes, let alone hair. We're gonna reward a person with maybe the first ever documented case of a negative IQ because they did a thing to themselves? Because a warning on a craft product said do not get on eyes clothing or skin and you know that's still open enough because maybe hair if it is not abundantly clear yet i hate this i hate this so much i will literally help fund or crowd fund gorilla glue to counter sue or defend themselves if i put hot sauce on my sink and i use it as eye drops or an exfoliator i should be able to sue for 0, 0.0 dollars because i'm a fucking dummy but also i do want to make it clear here that i only have these opinions regarding tessica if she is genuinely planning on trying to sue Gorilla Glue. But yeah, that's where I'll leave it. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show. It is Tuesday, February 9th, 2021. And let's just jump into the news of the day so you can get back to yours. Then we should definitely talk about CD Projekt Red in the news. If you're not familiar, they're the developer behind games such as Cyberpunk 2077 and Witcher 3. And they have now fallen victim to a cyber attack, saying in a statement on Twitter that its internal systems had been compromised by an unidentified actor who gained access to their network. With them also including a screenshot of a hacker's message reading, you have been epically pwned. The hacker then adding that they had obtained full copies of the source code for multiple games and saying, we have also dumped all of your documents relating to accounting, administration, legal, HR, investor relations, and more. If we will not come to an agreement, then your source codes will be sold or leaked online and your documents will be sent to our contacts in gaming journalism. Your public image will go down the shitter even more and people will see how your shitty company functions. Investors will lose trust in your company and the stock will dive even lower. You have 48 hours to contact us. However, in their statement, even CD Projekt Red said that they will, quote, not give in to the demands nor negotiate with the actor, being aware this may eventually lead to the release of the compromised data. The company adding that it's reaching out to people who may be affected by the breach, but that the compromised systems didn't house what they called any personal data of our players or users of our services. Also saying that its backups remain intact and that it had already begun restoring data. Also claiming that they've contacted law enforcement and IT forensic specialists in hopes of catching the hacker. But uh, honestly, one of the most interesting things with this story was the reaction, right? The reaction from people was 
was all over the place. Or, you know, some people saying this is horrible. You have this company and more importantly, the people that work at that company being blackmailed. Some going as far to call this terrorism. So you have that and then you have this whole range of reactions ultimately bring us to the full other side where you had people happy this happened. A number of people seemingly saying this is a just consequence for Cyberpunk 2077's buggy launch. Right, people saying this is fair game, it's to be expected. But also, regarding those reactions, we saw people like Alex Mukala tweeting, people who say this is fair or to be expected because of the problems of Cyberpunk 2077 should take a good look in the mirror and ask themselves how fair their lives would be if they got death threats, hacked, and things of that nature for each time they mess something up. Then, let's talk marijuana. It's becoming more and more mainstream's not the word. Word, but you know, it's becoming legal, more accepted by people that previously might have gone, no, that's the devil's lettuce. And connected to that, we've seen things like marijuana stocks going through the roof. Afria, for example, has just been doing numbers, but that doesn't mean that there is still a long road to go and hurdles in the way. For example, yesterday we saw a South Dakota circuit judge reject a constitutional amendment to legalize recreational marijuana that was approved by voters in November by 54%. That case was brought before the judge shortly after the election in a lawsuit filed by the state's highway patrol superintendent and a county sheriff, with the two arguing that the constitutional amendment known as Amendment A was not legal because it covers more than one subject, and saying that it actually created an entirely new section to the state's constitution rather than amending an existing section. So instead, it should be considered a revision, which is notable because a revision requires a convention of state delegates to approve the measure before it is placed on the ballot. Also, with this, a really weird and actually significant thing here is that the same taxpayers who approved this law, right, they voted themselves, they found themselves paying for the effort to overturn this decision. This because the state's governor, Christy Nome, who has spoken out against the initiative, issued an executive order directing the lawsuit to be filed and also ordered that the state pay the legal fees. And also of note here, the judge who made this decision, Christina Klinger, was appointed by Nome. But despite this news, the battle is not over because this decision is expected to be appealed to the state Supreme Court. So if the justices or another higher court overturn Klinger's decision, the law will go into effect on July 1st. But I mean, let's be honest, it's hard not to see this as a way of just subverting the, the majority will of the people. Then in a different kind of hacker story, let's look to Florida, where you had Florida officials announcing that a hacker had breached the computer systems of a water plant in a small town and briefly increased the amount of lye in the water to incredibly dangerous levels. Right, that is horrifying. You had a hacker trying to poison the water supply. And the only reason we're not talking about a way Worst story is reportedly the plant operators noticed right away and fixed their systems before anyone was put into danger. But understand, you had law enforcement officials saying that if this had not been caught, the lie could have seeped into the town's water supply in 24 to 36 hours. While this specific attack, yes, was caught, this hack is incredibly concerning because it's the exact kind of cyber attack on critical infrastructure that experts have been warning about for years. For example, last July, you had the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency warning that critical infrastructure like water and power plants are, quote, attractive targets for foreign powers attempting to do harm to U.S. interests or retaliate for perceived U.S. aggression. And it's actually the attack on these smaller municipal facilities that is the most concerning. This because experts say they often don't have the same protections as the larger utilities. With one security researcher telling reporters, these are the targets we worry about. This is a small municipality that is likely small budgeted and under-resourced, which purposely set up remote access so employees and outside contractors can remote in. And as of right now, that is really all we know. It is unclear who launched the attack or what the motive was, though local officials have reportedly partnered with the FBI and Secret Service to investigate. Then in entertainment slash is he lying news, let's talk about Tom Holland. There's a lot of excitement, there's a lot of hype for Spider-Man 3. Right in the lead up for this movie, we've seen a lot of reports and news about who may or may not be in the movie. Right, you see things that are more kind of basic, understandable, Doctor Strange, right, Benedict Cumberbatch. But then we start seeing reports like Jamie Foxx is set to be reprising his role as Electro from The Amazing Spider-Man 2. Then reports that Alfred Molina is gonna be reprising his role as Doc Ock from Spider-Man 2. Notably, those are not Marvel films, right? There's this whole complicated Sony, what I'm not gonna even go into it. And so with that, we saw many fans going, oh, we're going, we're diving headfirst into the multiverse, which among other things could introduce the X-Men to the MCU. Right? And so along those lines, we started seeing reports that Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield would be coming back as their own versions of Peter Parker. But Two, it does appear that we are headed into the multiverse. I mean, the, the, <laughs> the biggest clue is that Doctor Strange's second movie is going to be titled Multiverse of Madness, as well as what just happened on the newest episode of WandaVision, which I won't mention uh, for those that maybe have not watched it yet. But the news today is Tom Holland has said that uh, Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield are not 
in Spider-Man 3. Telling Esquire, no, no, they will not be appearing in this film unless they have hidden the most massive piece of information from me, which I think it's too big of a secret for them to keep from me. But as of yet, no, it'll be a continuation of the Spider-Man movies that we've been making. And then let's take a second to pay some bills and thank the fantastic sponsor of today's show, Squarespace. Whether you need a domain, a website, an online store, a whatever, make it with Squarespace. Squarespace empowers people of all kinds to create their online web presence or launch their passion projects. And it's a place that so many people trust and where everyone can find and make a home. It's also easy to see why there is nothing to install, patch, or upgrade ever. And creating a beautiful website with Squarespace's all-in-one platform has never been so simple. It is extremely intuitive and easy to use. It also includes really fantastic things. Things like gaining access to their award-winning marketing tools and analytics. And you can get personalized support from their award-winning customer care team via email, or live chat. Whatever you need, they are available 24 seven to help out. So if you wanna check this out, see why so many people love it, see if it is for you, which I think it will be. Go ahead and start your free trial today over at squarespace.com slash Phil. And when you realize you love it, make sure you enter an offer code Phil to get 10% off your first purchase. Then in international news, we first look to Myanmar, which is now facing its fourth day of ongoing protests with the government more severely cracking down. Throughout the country, we've seen hundreds of thousands defying the military and protesting their coup. As far as the escalated response, yesterday there were instances where police began using water cannons to disperse crowds. Today, we're seeing police escalate their force by firing rubber bullets and tear gas into crowds. We've also seen allegations in some reports of live ammunition also being used as well. One of the largest protests, which was in the capital, was dispersed after police threatened to fire on protesters with actual ammunition if they crossed a literal line on the ground after hours of clashing between the two sides. Also, late on Tuesday there, an 8 p.m. to 4 a.m. curfew and a ban on gatherings of five or more people was instituted, all of which have been largely ignored. We've also seen many protesters chanting people's police in an effort to get the police to join in on the movement, although that has largely not happened. Which actually, on that note, reports suggest that at least in Mandalay, home of course to the largest protest, at least 27 people have been arrested so far. In a news conference this morning aired on state television, and with the irony seemingly lost on them, we saw the military junta telling protesters that, quote, democracy can be destroyed if there is no discipline. To which many of the protesters essentially responded, what democracy you literally took over after a democratic election? And as far as what happens next, what happens moving forward. I mean, th there's no expectation for these protests to calm down. And as far as the military, they have reportedly set up a new election commission to investigate its claim of mass voter fraud. Though, very important to note here, before the military coup, the last commission said not only was there no fraud, but also that the alleged fraud would not have been enough to overturn the election. So we'll have to wait and see there. But in the meantime, let's look to Israel. Because there, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is in the midst of a corruption trial that has shaken the Israeli government and political scene. On Monday, we saw Netanyahu making his way to court before a large crowd of people people dressed as prisoners featuring signs such as crime minister. And as a quick reminder, because this, <laughs> this has gone on for so long. There have been so many elections in Israel and this has just been like the giant shit on the carpet right in the middle. So as a reminder, he is accused of three different charges. One, accepting nearly $300,000 in gifts from 2006 to 2018. Gifts that were reportedly from an Israeli expat and others in exchange for pressuring the legislature to pass tax exemptions for expats like them. Two, a quid pro quo agreement that would see him getting positive news coverage in one newspaper if he would push legislation that would weaken its rival. And three, accepting favors from a couple who own a telecom business with that couple hoping that their favors and their gifts would lead the prime minister to not interfering with their business interests. And as far as Bibi, on Monday, he did what he's been doing. He said he was not guilty. He was there for a minimal amount of time, reportedly given permission to leave the courtroom after just 20 minutes. We also saw the prime minister's team move to delay the evidentiary stage of the trial, something that the judges say they'll actually consider due to the elections only being six weeks away. Elections, of course, that were triggered after the legislature failed to pass a budget back in December. So, you know, more potential delays and waiting and redos. I mean, ultimately, it's kind of more of the same story in Israel. But then finally, in international news, we look to China. And this, in part, because the editor-in-chief of the Global Times China's nationalist state-run paper warned that any countries who boycott next year's Winter Olympics will face sanctions. This warning, notably coming after multiple groups and people have called for countries and athletes to boycott the games. Last week, for example, several Republican senators introduced a resolution to have the United States demand that China move the games after its treatment of Uyghurs in Xinjiang was declared a genocide. Though that resolution was not passed and the administration stated, we are not currently talking about changing our posture or our plans as it relates to the Beijing Olympics. But it did reiterate that China needed to change course in Xinjiang. We also saw the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee opposing the boycott, saying we oppose games boycotts because they have been shown to negatively impact athletes while not effectively addressing global issues. And we believe the more effective course of action is for the governments of the world and China to engage directly on human rights and political issues. But that, of course, hasn't stopped at least 180 human rights groups from urging nations to boycott the games due to China's ongoing human rights abuses. But 
So far, no nation has decided to do so. Then, let's talk about some of the coronavirus and vaccine news that's out there. Starting with the news that about 10% of Americans have gotten a coronavirus vaccine, but of course the vaccination rate differs from state to state. In states like Alaska, for example, they're closer to around 15%, but in some states like Alabama, Iowa, Missouri, Idaho, and Kansas, they're under 8%. Also, there's been the question of, are the people who need it the most getting it first? And well, obviously there, there are a number of different high-risk groups. One of the first that come to mind are people 65 and older. And there, according to a new analysis from the Kaiser Family Foundation, in most states, vaccination rates for older Americans are either around or under 30% as of last week, which, hey, is a decent percentage, but it does also show that there is a long road ahead of us, especially because we're seeing things like a discussion among medical experts about the most effective way to use the country's vaccine supply. Last week, for example, you had a top infectious disease expert who advised Biden's transition team on the pandemic, saying that he supports giving the first dose to as many people over the age of 65 as possible before worrying about second doses. However, Biden's chief medical advisor, Dr. Anthony Fauci, has stood by the nation's two-dose regimen strategy, with him stressing in several recent interviews that getting people the second dose is our best shot at controlling COVID-19 and its variants. Now, he has also said that it is not unreasonable to consider a single-dose approach, but he says that studying that right now just isn't practical because it takes too long to see meaningful results. What we have right now and what we must go with is the scientific data that we've accumulated and it's really very solid. But Fauci also warning that a single dose plan may actually create more problems. The way viruses respond to pressure, you could actually be inadvertently selecting for more mutants by a suboptimal response. So for that reason, we have continued to go by the fact that we feel the optimum approach would be to continue with getting as many people on their first dose as possible, but also making sure that people on time get their second dose. And Fauci is not alone here. We've also seen people like Richard Besser, who was the acting CDC director under former President Obama, saying that he agrees with Fauci's approach, saying he has concerns about the one dose regimen. We could be providing people with suboptimal levels of protection. Also, another challenge with the coronavirus and the vaccine is information, which is actually one of the reasons that we saw Facebook in the news today, because they announced that they are now banning vaccine misinformation entirely. The updated policy reportedly extending past COVID-19 and COVID-19 vaccines to include vaccines in general during the pandemic. The claims like vaccines are not effective or toxic or cause autism. But also, there are doubts among many that Facebook will actually enforce this in a meaningful way. As you know, all of their failures up until this point. So, like always with Facebook, we're gonna have to wait and see. But uh, I will say a notable thing about the new announcement. Facebook said not only are they focusing on pages and accounts, but they'll also be focusing their enforcement on groups, which has been a constant and big request from critics of Facebook. But yeah, at the end of the day, it's Facebook. I'll wait to see what actually happens rather than what they just say is gonna happen. And finally, with COVID, one of the big questions has been, where did it come from? Regarding that question, we now have the World Health Organization saying that COVID most likely originated in animals and spread to humans, dismissing that whole lab leak theory. This coming from a team of experts led by the World Health Organization just releasing the first details of their fact-finding mission into the coronavirus's origins. Most notably there, the group said that it was extremely unlikely that the virus leaked from a lab in Wuhan, China. That, of course, was a theory fueled partially by former President Trump and his supporters, with some saying that it was intentionally manufactured, others suggesting that it just accidentally leaked. But we've since seen those speculations largely being dismissed by scientists around the globe and Chinese researchers from the lab. Instead, the WHO study saying that it is more likely that the virus did actually jump from a bat to another animal and then to humans. But since Wuhan is not a natural environment for bats, it is still unclear how the virus was introduced into the city, with the WHO arguing that its hypothesis warrants more studies and targeted research. But unsurprisingly, we saw former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo coming out to express doubt in the findings. Right, which makes sense. He's one of the Trump staffers who has long pushed the lab theory, and he again claimed that there is significant evidence to prove it, though he hasn't actually said what that evidence is. He also continued to claim that the Trump administration left the World Health Organization because it is corrupt with China's influence. And that is ultimately where we are right now, but researchers are continuing their study, so we'll have to keep an eye out for more updates when they come. And actually with this story or really anything else that stuck out to you today, I'd love to know your thoughts in those comments down below because this is the end of the show. As always, thanks for being a part of my daily dives in the news. Subscribe and like and all the good stuff. If you need more to watch, I got you covered right there. But as always, I love your faces and you've just been filled in with news that matters for people that care. I'll see you tomorrow.